Peace be with thee. I am Kara, Holy Protector, Guardian of Anapus. Seek you the Maven, the sword forged of twin metals. It is a mortal instrument of the Black Fire. Only the Maven can challenge the coming darkness. Something has happened. Something evil. We must consult with the oracles of Ishad Na to learn more. To unearth what has not been seen in the Gale Saren for many generations. The Maven Sword. Go now, quickly, and return to me with the Fabled Blade. Far back in the ancient days of 1992, the pioneering video game company Surtech released Wizardry 7, one of the greatest video games ever made, and there was much rejoicing. And there was much rejoicing. But all was not well in the kingdom of Surtech. After a lawsuit and some cross words, the mighty designer of Wizardry 5, 6, and 7, David W. Bradley, left the company, leaving the future of the Wizardry series uncertain. The next and final game in that series would be designed by others at Surtech and finally released in 2001. But what of the wunderkind that started the Cosmic Forge saga that we all know and love? Bradley designed the action FPS game Cyber Mage in 1995, a great game by the way, and eventually returned to the RPG genre with a spiritual successor to the Wizardry series called Wizards and Warriors, designed by the company he founded, Heuristic Park. The game took four years to develop and was released a full year before Wizardry 8 in September of 2000. Despite stealing a march on their rival, the D.W. Bradley RPG game which fans had been waiting for for almost eight years was not well received on release. Unlike its cousin Wizardry 8, which similarly failed to achieve financial success, but gained cult status as a great game anyway, Wizards and Warriors has been largely forgotten in the 20 years since its release. It was so ignored that the game has, as of 2019, not been released on Steam, and only recently in August of 2018 was it released on GOG.com. So is this an unfairly maligned classic ready to come back into the light of day, or is it something that should have stayed buried beneath the desert sands lest its curse rise up and destroy us all? Let's find out. And by the way, I am going to be spoiling the entire game. It is 20 years old at this point, but I'm going to spoil everything the game has, just to let you know. Also, let's get this out of the way right now. This is not, I repeat, not the 1987 action RPG for the Nintendo Entertainment System, Wizards and Warriors. This is a completely different Wizards and Warriors. It's really confusing that they chose this name. There wasn't as much overlap back then between PC RPGs and console RPGs, and maybe people thought that, you know, maybe they didn't know about the game or thought everyone would forget about it. But it's just weird that two games both in the RPG genre, have taken the name Wizards and Warriors, and it always gets confusing, but it's not the NES game, it's the PC game, Wizards and Warriors. So when you boot up the game, you're tasked with creating a party of six players. I'm happy to report that Wizards and Warriors did an excellent job with PC variety, aesthetic, and crucially, advancement. The classes aren't quite as good as they were in Wizardry 7 and 8, but I was content with the variety of playstyles. If anything, it felt a little bit too easy to advance and change classes without the work necessary in Wizardry 8, especially because you get a special item that allows you to advance your stats for free and you get dozens and dozens of these items, it's pretty simplistic to get the requisite stats to go to what class you want to be. You start out as one of four basic classes, the Warrior, Rogue, Priest, and Wizard, which conform to the standard four classes in D&D Basic. But then, like in the Wizardry games, you can branch off from these four starter classes once your character has received the additional stats required. In a somewhat telling mix of old and new design, Wizards and Warriors has a somewhat mixed stat allocation system. You get to choose what stat to level up, unlike Wizardry 7 where it's totally random, but it is random if you get a stat to level up at all. Some level ups you get one stat or two or none. This can be gamed very easily by saving and reloading after you level up if you get an unsatisfactory number of stats. It all seems a little bit pointless. In order to advance beyond the four basic classes, the PC needs also to perform some sort 
sort of quest, such as killing a powerful wolf or retrieving a weapon from a haunted graveyard, most of which are pretty simplistic, although some of them are much more difficult. These advanced classes include paladins, a mixture of priest and warrior, samurai, a mixture of warrior and wizard, that uses Japanese-style weapons and armor, and the drab barbarian, which doesn't give you any magic abilities, but does vastly increase your ability to kill enemies in melee combat. Increase my killing power, eh? Let's do it! Whether referred to as character progression or epic power fantasy, watching your party transform from humble noobs barely able to swing a sword to mighty gladiators who can crush dragons or demons is done beautifully in Wizards and Warriors. Some class ascensions even require unique quests that you must discover during the game, adding an air of mystery and puzzle solving to this. One quest requires you to find four sacred books for each of the natural elements, and will unlock a unique Zen Master class that has extraordinary abilities. Class progression and Wizards and Warriors is an addictive process that keeps the player always wanting to get a little bit stronger, advance one more rank, get one more stat. It reminds me of an older time before a more classless, choose-however-you-want-to-proceed style was added in modern games like Skyrim. The races also include a heady mix of choices. There are the standard humans, elves, dwarves, etc., but also my favorite beast creatures like lizard folk, cat people, and even elephant men called umphas. They each have their own special ability, like the cat people race, called whiskas in the game, who have night vision, allowing them to see better in the dark. I found that useful to avoid casting a light spell all the time to see the pigmen, and who are permanently tracking enemies, presumably because they can smell them with their pig-like noses. Some have negatives as well as positives. The elephant men, for instance, can only wear specialized armor that has been designed to fit their over their huge bodies. My favorite type of creatures are always the weird monstrous ones that Bradley added to the Wizardry series back with Wizardry 6. In judging the character creation system, I tend to weigh diversity of playstyle and number of roles to take on, you know? How many times can you play through the game while going through it with a slightly different style. The game provides a good architecture of creatures to add to your adventuring party, and a very wizardry-esque progression of classes from basic to advanced to super advanced with the Zen Master. It unfortunately doesn't quite have the spit and polish Wizardry 8 had, but it's it's suitable, but something like the Wizardry 8 Samurai being a mixed wizard warrior, but also having that extra critical strike and lightning strike ability, that just adds a certain level of ability above it. They're, they're more sophisticated and you can get more out of those characters than you can in Wizards and Warriors. They've, they've been stripped down. It feels like the game, despite taking four years, wasn't quite finished. They needed to advance things a little bit more to get it right. And that's something of a recurring theme in this game, that they seemed they needed another year or two to work out all of the kinks here and get them really not just up to snuff, but to the extraordinary level that we expected from a D.W. Bradley game. As an example of why I think the game wasn't quite finished and needed a little bit more polish, take this little moment outside of the tomb of Anaphis, where we're met by the mystic Sphinx. Stop! He warned! I am the guardian sphinx of this shrine. Answer my question, and I will grant you entry into this tomb. Hail, and I am sworn to destroy you. The Sphinx asks us a bunch of questions, and if we don't provide the correct answers to them, he attacks us and we won't be able to enter the temple. However, you don't actually need to do it. You see, if you just come to it from the right here, you just, you just, he just doesn't see you. You just, you can just walk past him. Like, it seems kind of silly, like this was supposed to be a big major moment of, of the level. It just seems kind of silly, like this was supposed to be a big major part of this level, and you can just kind of walk around him instead of, you know, having to answer the questions. It just kind of, doesn't make any sense. Like, you know, it's it's just kind of silly that you can just walk around. The main plot of Wizards and Warriors is not spectacular. It concerns that most ancient of RPG stories, an evil wizard who was out to do nefarious things to the good and honest people of the world of Gale Saran. I am Pharaoh Shedutrakhan, Lord of Darkness, God of Desire, Devourer of Souls. In order to combat him, you must discover a magical sword with the laughable name of the Maven. The Maven Sword. A blade forged of twin metals. One cursed by evil. The other blessed by the divine. Blessed by the divine. Blessed. 
The Maven kind of sounds like a 1920s actress. It doesn't have the punch of Excalibur or Durandale or Flame of the West or some other truly cool name like that. I just kept laughing when I heard the name, The Maven. Finding the sword occupies the first two-thirds of the game, while the final third is about tracking down the evil wizard's tomb and slaying him. And he's actually pretty cool. Khan was a pharaoh in ancient times and tried to destroy the world before he was stopped by the great hero Anaphes and the angel Kara. He seems to be trying to attain godhood as the lord of desire and evil. Maybe he's related to Le Leviathan, lord of desire from Hellraiser 2. Evil wizard is a pretty basic trope of fantasy games, but at least Set has personality, such as when he tears out the blackened heart of one of his undead underlings and sends him to be chained to a wall of his tomb and tortured for all eternity. Look what and done to me. Lord Set's demonic devil has picked up my heart. And chained me here to suffer for all eternity. Please help me. Find my heart and put an end to my misery. Wizards and Warriors can't really hold a candle in terms of plot or story to other games coming out around that time like Arcanum or Planescape Torment, but it's unfair to compare the two. Wizards and Warriors isn't an in-depth, plot-heavy game. It's a thrilling fantasy adventure, and I loved it for what it was. But the plot is not the only thing that goes under the heading of story. World design and setting are just as important, and Wizards and Warriors brilliantly succeeds at immersing you in a rich fantasy world. You are free to wander around wherever you wish from the start of the game, with few artificial barriers keeping you locked in place. The opening of the game is a charming medieval village leading to a cemetery. There are thick forests to explore, and there's even a horse to find or ride around in one. With all kinds of monsters and treasure around, eventually you'll reach a long winding river and get a raft to ride down. You can find a swamp and explore a town filled with frog people. Here! Do not hurt, or dog people become bad. Toad's glad you are here! You may enter Toad Village now! My roommate was a frog kid. You ever see a frog kid? After that, you find a group of prophets that give you a little bit more backstory about what you're trying to do and where you have to go. Past them is the ancient town of Ishad Na, and next to Ishad Na is a gigantic temple in the shape of a cobra. The cultists inside are fond of poison and worship nagas and giant snake gods. Two, three years ago, it was just another snake cult. Now, everywhere. It is said that they are deceivers. They murder people in the night. I know nothing. Past the temple is another forest concealing a huge underground city of dwarves. You have to ride on rail cars, Indiana Jones style, through lava filled tunnels, eventually gaining access to the lair of the mighty dragon Arathsmador. You also get to explore a gigantic haunted castle. You finally get to meet one of the ancient knights who once wielded the blade of the maven, and he can explain to you how to go to the dragon Arathsmador and get it by learning the sacred password. Then it's off to the coastal city of Brimlock Rune. Once you buy a pirate ship, you can sail across the Lost Sea, cross a desert into an ancient Egyptian tomb. Maybe the most enchanting part of the game is a journey deep beneath the ocean, to a sunken Atlantis-like city called Colosseum, filled with mermaids and weird sea creatures. The variety of dungeons, buildings, towns, and geography are impressive. It makes you feel like you really are on an epic quest, a truly heroic journey across various nations and across an entire world to distant lands. The graphics are about what you'd expect from a game released in 2000. Kind of blocky and pixelated, but because I grew up in this era, it didn't really bother me much. I was completely immersed in Gale Saron, its races, people, and places. Outside of the main quest to find the Celestial Sword, you also get a number of side quests quests from the various guilds. I love the diversity of having odd East Asian elements like the Bushi Dojo that trains ninjas. I also love that the Thieves Guild isn't marked on the map as such in the town. It's called a pawn shop, and it's tucked away in the corner of the map. I didn't even find it at first because it's supposed to be semi-hidden from everything. You can join the various guilds, and when you do, you're allowed a second set of things to buy, and usually the 
really good equipment is held behind that wall of actually being a member of the guild. Some of the quests you get at the temples, warriors guild, mages guild, etc. are necessary for advancing character class, but most of them are really pointless. They're just to send you in a certain direction and let you find some minor treasure. The rewards, though, may be really useful if you're starved of gold early on, but mostly I just kind of ignored them or only went back to complete them if I encountered the quest anyway and something I was doing. Sometimes it's actually bad to complete the quest. One time I found a two-handed katana called the Nodachi of Stone. This weapon was one of the best swords in the game, and it really did mean of stone. It could turn enemies to stone, which is one of the best status effects in the entire game to inflict on your opponents. So when they asked me to turn it in for a few measly gold pieces, I laughed in their face and left. I'm keeping this darn thing. Outside of the actual towns, you're going to have to encounter NPCs in the regular world. Some will give you helpful hints if you ask the right questions, some give you side quests or items, and a few are evil and waiting to attack you at the right moment. Talking is done in a confusing and difficult manner, that, that user interface again. You have to click the talk option in the HUD when you see an NPC in the world. Sometimes this glitches out and causes you to spin around for no reason. You can also get in trouble if you get bored and just leave without saying goodbye. Sometimes the NPC will will then start following you around until you actually officially end the conversation. It's a little weird and uncomfortable and confusing to start out with. Also, even if you don't want to talk to someone, they'll launch into their dialogue if you go anywhere near them. Dialogue consists of typing in keywords. During a conversation, more and more new keywords highlighted in blue will appear. You should make sure to try out as many keywords as you can. Sometimes you'll get repeat dialogue, but other times it's needed to get an item or to progress. NPC dialogue is usually pretty boring and appears slowly. I just want to be able to skip most of it. You can be attacked during dialogue. This reminded me a lot of Fallout 4 and that nonsense. Like, take this moment here where I'm speaking to Lord Anifis and getting really important plot-relevant dialogue here, but I can't read it because I was attacked by a bunch of random samurai over here and have to go fight them during the dialogue scene. I have awakened from the eternal sleep and man but one thing. The incarnate hell, the Dark Lord, Sethudwakan, lives again. Yeah, don't you love it when that's in a game? I'm sitting here talking to someone and a giant spider rolls up and tries to eat my face and he just keeps yammering on. The way the game records your quests and dialogue is even more confusing. Each character will have a list of all the quests perceived, but they are subdivided by the person who gave them to you. And half the time I can't remember these names or where they were or what the quest is talking about. And it's only in the list for that particular person that was speaking to them. There's not like a party list. If that guy was talking to that woman and got that quest, he is the only one that's going to have it. They also include all of the quests you received from that person, which you have to painstakingly scroll through minute sections of. The dialogue that's recorded is even worse. Whole conversations lasting 10 pages or more exist for some major NPCs. Good luck trying to figure out what the heck is going on there if you need to find a password or some sort of obscure reference to what you have to do. You pretty much have to keep track of what's going on yourself at all times, so if, if there are large gaps, say a week or more between play sessions, you could be in serious trouble if you don't remember exactly where you need to go or what to do. There are some really cool moments, though, in the Wizards and Warriors story. I especially liked at the end of the game where the warrior angel Kira is possessed by the evil set, and you have to throw holy water on her so she turns good. I need holy water. I cannot fight that evil spell much longer. To save yourself, Bring me holy water. Hurry! The beast within me shall soon be born again. Bless me, my children. You have saved me. The holy water has destroyed the evil spell that set cast upon me.
It reminded me of Silent Hill 1, where you have to throw a Glophidus onto Sybil Bennett in order to save her from possession. Maybe Wizards and Warriors ripped off Silent Hill, I, I don't know. I also love the haunted ruins of Sherujan Castle. You have to actually sneak in through the moat, and a bunch of places underneath the moat will get you into the castle eventually, and you can open the door from the inside. Overall, while the story doesn't really reach the heights that we like to talk about with the great successes of RPG gaming, it really works for what it is, and I, I enjoyed playing it. I had a really fun immersing myself in this fantasy world, which really is what an RPG is all about. Part of any epic quest is, naturally, the acquisition of great wealth and fantastically powerful weapons and armor. You can get all sorts of swords, axes, spears, bows and arrows, East Asian weaponry like katanas and two-handed katanas and wakazashis, and all kinds of medieval armor, and even Japanese-style samurai or ninja armor. But I wasn't exactly blown away. It's just a few swords and axes and daggers and maybe a magic staff to break at the monotony. It doesn't really seem to capture that sort of advanced overload of different weapon types that I really enjoy in a game. There are a few cursed items in the game that you can't remove and drain your HP, but I found it draining things a little too slowly. I actually wondered if the game was glitched and I wasn't losing health at all. The Skull Dagger makes an appearance, by the way, so keep an eye out for that in case you accidentally notice your character can't remove a dagger and may slowly be losing their HP. In general, the cursed weapons seemed really useful, especially if you wanted to get your magical characters who really can't use anything but a staff weapon, because those staff weapons, while they don't do a lot of damage, tend to have a status affliction like sleep or even stone or poison or paralyze. And you get a little one-two punch action by getting the status effect by attacking with the staff on your weaker characters and softening up the enemy for your barbarian or your paladin. Perhaps similar to the wizardry games, Wizards and Warriors has many more useful swords than any other class of weapon. Aside from one really good spear I found at the end of the game, magic swords outclassed axes and clubs, rendering those weapon skills somewhat pointless. It would have been nice if there was some sort of distinction between the different weapons like there was in the wizardry games. Like, for instance, the fact that you can use pole arms from the back row, or the fact that you have a higher chance to knock out an enemy using a mace weapon. It's just something that doesn't seem sophisticated enough next to Wizardry 8. Save your money. It may not seem like it at first, but until the end of the game, it's possible to be reduced to penury due to how much identification, buying new gear and spells, and healing all cost in the end. Even if you seem like you have a huge amount of wealth, it can be wiped down out when you go to town. You'll be finding a huge amount of treasure scattered about the game. For some reason, this is especially true towards the final third of Wizards and Warriors. There are treasure chests every few feet, it seems all stuffed with items for you to use or sell. And as always in these games, you're going to have to deal with that most frustrating RPG element, limited item carry capacity. Now, it not only uses a weight system, it also uses a space system, so it's not just how heavy something is, you can only carry a certain amount of it. Unlike in Wizardry, 8, which really lightened that up, where it's really just based on weight there and you can carry an infinite amount of items in the party inventory, here you're always going to be worried about leaving behind a sword or a magic staff or something that you're not too sure about. It, it can also get very confusing because this game has point-and-click adventure style elements to it, where you're going to have to carry around little oddments, I guess you could call them, little tchotchkes of things that you might need in the future if you want to go back to an area, so you may never be able to get rid of them, like like this bridge crank thing. If I could get rid of it, but, you know, I may want to go back to that area at some point in the game, so I don't dare throw it away. Or you may carry around for a long, long time something that you're not quite certain what it's used for, but you think you may need it. And it's really just kind of tedious how much this takes up your time figuring out where to store things in order to bring them back to town because you're really going to want to sell that stuff because you need money, but it's a little bit irritating. Almost all treasure chests are trapped, and you'll need a character with the locks and traps skill to open them. If you try to force them open, you can be subjected to fireballs, mana drains, and even being turned to stone. Oddly, I found almost all the chests to be very easy to open, and almost never triggered a trap until the final third of the game. It was like the difficulty spike just went way, way up. It wasn't properly balanced to get slightly harder as the game progressed. Gathering items, whether from 
from treasure chests or dead enemies is confusing and poorly implemented. In Wizardry 8, when you open a chest, a small window pops up and you can pick and choose what to take. In Wizards and Warriors, all of the items are sitting there in real time in the chest and must be retrieved individually with a click. It's very difficult to pick up every item because of how small they can be. Crucially, if a character doesn't have the room to pick it up, they'll tell you so and just drop it back on the ground. The same thing can happen when you try to trade items between characters, and you can leave an all-important item you need just dropped on the ground accidentally because you didn't notice that the character said, wait a minute, I can't take this, I don't have any room. Rings, scrolls, and amulets are especially challenging, and it becomes a nuisance after a while to make your clicking pixel perfect. The game also has a lighting system, so you may not be able to see everything perfectly on the ground. You at least know that the chest is empty when the fluff image of gold and treasure that the items sit on goes away. When enemies drop items after dying, they all scatter around their corpse waiting to be picked up. If you pick up one type of item, say an arrow, by clicking on it, then the game remembers for a moment that you are picking up these items and allows you to just walk over all of the other dropped arrows nearby. You should just automatically pick up all items like Link walking over a rupee and then discard them if you don't need them. This can be horrible when it's a plot necessary item like a key. If you don't remember to carry carefully search every tiny pixel around one of the cult priests in the Serpent Temple level, you'll miss a vital key you need to progress. I spent hours scouring the temple, wondering what part of the puzzle I wasn't understanding, not realizing till later on when I looked it up. Thankfully, the key was still there even after multiple quits and reloads. If it wasn't, I wouldn't be able to continue the game. Don't overthink your items. Just give us a list so we can shove it in the backpack, okay? Why are your keys even part of the inventory at all? I'll be returning Turning to this issue later on. Tragically, Wizards and Warriors retains an uncomfortable antique style of user interface. You have to manage six separate inventories without Wizardry 8's benefit of an all-encompassing party inventory. All six PCs each have their own gold supply that must be laboriously shifted between members when it shops. Even worse, each time you switch from one character to another, the shopkeeper goes into his unskippable introductory dialogue, which freezes your actions for a few seconds. Hardly conducive to easy switching back and forth while comparing weapons. Items, both shopkeeper items you intend to buy and your items you intend to sell, are displayed in a long, ungainly row. It's hard to compare things at a glance, and it doesn't feel right. Identification of items is also quite baffling. If you identify an item at the store, say a longsword plus one, all items in that particular character's inventory that are also longswords plus one are instantly identified for free. However, any longswords plus one in the other five PC inventories are not identified, and you are recharged if you switch to their backpack and ask to identify the same thing. This makes it most cost-effective to tediously gather all items of similar type in one backpack to minimize cost. Especially early on in the game, you can't waste money with separate costly identifications. Just another ancient gameplay concept that should have been discarded long ago. Heading back home and disposing of items for money is an ancient RPG tradition, and this game fails to streamline the process. It adds a sense of antiquated tedium to something that should be relaxing and fun after a hard time puzzle-solving and fighting monsters in the dungeons. The UI of the game is generally not great, and I'm not just saying that because it's a 20-year-old game. I mean, even for the year 2000, it felt a little bit old-fashioned and odd. Certainly poor compared to Wizardry 8, which streamlined everything. Though I do like that there's a cool little 3D model of your character that changes when you give them a new item for equipment. And that's pretty cool that it actually changes for you. The game has an unusual saving and loading system. You can't save or load in the safety of town, you have to leave to do that. And you can't load while playing the game, you have to quit first and go back to the title screen. When you click start your adventure, the game takes you between the different towns you find in the game, where you can go to separate inns. There you can theoretically recruit new characters, except the ones that have save files, they're considered out on adventure. Every time I was playing, I thought the same thing. Why? Yeah, why? This is all pointless, it's a ridiculous waste of time. No one is or should play the game that way, you just save and then reload. The whole process is nonsense. Overall, the UI of the game really felt kind of lacking. It just feels a little bit too old-fashioned, like they didn't quite keep up with the times. Level design is where Wizards and Warriors really shines. More modern games like Skyrim or Dragon Age have linear levels. The spaces tend to be big and open, with one obvious path to follow. This is partly due to changes 
changes in who RPGs are marketed towards, but it's also a response to the greater complexity in crafting a truly complicated level in full 3D. Games like Quake or Hexen were able to do it, even though they weren't RPGs exactly. They could still make a big, confusing 3D area, but modern games just tend not to do that. Wizards and Warriors is a remarkable example of keeping the confounding hugeness of grid-based game design adapted to full 3D. All of the major dungeons are gigantic, with multiple paths and secret doors to keep you guessing about the right way to go. Most levels have an admirably vertical quality about them, sending you up and down levels in a full 3D space, rather than just blandly forward and back. Some dungeons even have subterranean rivers that you have to navigate. In one truly amazing moment, I was swimming down to the bottom of a lake deep within a mountain, and was surprised to find a door at the bottom of the lake containing a vital clue to the next area. This little secret path was an incredible moment, and uh, just a, a part of the game I absolutely love and treasure. Light to moderate puzzle elements such as a hidden room in the middle of an elevator path can be occasionally confusing. Still, it's better to be too complex than too easy. One area I really got confused in was in the Dwarven Mines, where you have to go back and forth on this minecart into different areas, gathering certain items from one area then bringing them to another. It was very confusing to orient myself and figure out where I needed to bring each item. Games that are too complex may be frustrating, but games that are too easy are guaranteed to discourage engagement and encourage refusing to play the game again. The maps are filled with hidden walls, secret buttons, and collapsing floors. It was very, very engaging compared to Skyrim's walk to the end of the hallway, go through a door, kill a zombie, go to the end of the hallway, get a treasure chest. It's just so basic and simplistic. They're worrying way too much about the combat and not enough about exploration. Adventure is exploration. It's travel from one area to the other. How do I get here? How do I figure out where I'm going? It's an aspect of the modern RPG system that has been genuinely oversimplified to focus way too much on the fighting aspect and not enough on the where the heck should I be going aspect. This is something that Wizardry 8, as great as it is, simply did not accomplish. That game can't hold a candle to Wizards and Warriors when it comes to the design, the layout of the levels. That game was far more straightforward in most areas and had a frequently dull and distinct distinctly unstimulating lack of style. The areas were often too big and open, and I knew where I was pretty much all the time. Wizards and Warriors levels are labyrinths, just like the good old days of the 80s RPGs, and you will get lost wandering around them, and I loved that. Movement is no longer on a grid system like it was in Wizardry 7, and feels a lot more like Wizardry 8's movement style, as you can freely explore the 3D space. Your characters can run if you hold down the shift key, sort of like in an FPS game of the time. Unfortunately, they constantly make an obnoxious, heavy breathing noise when they run. Maybe I just have a bit of a phobia about that, but listening to it over and over again for tens of hours, I mean, it was terrible. Doesn't anyone else find that sound intensely irritating? Sort of like people loudly chewing. Chewing. It's just, I, I can't take it and wish it was gone. You, strangely enough, do not have any kind of stamina system, though, like you did in Wizardry 8, so you can just run anywhere freely. I'm not sure how to feel about that, because it does encourage you to, well, run around all the time and not pay attention, but it is very liberating. The map, unfortunately, does not function correctly in these very complicated levels, mainly because it only shows you, like, a few feet ahead of your character. It's divided the map into odd little chunks, even if you fully explored the area before. Also map markers that you make show up on the big map, but they don't show up on the mini map, so you constantly have to keep opening and closing it. It's a little annoying. There are some light platforming elements to the game, like jumping across this bridge surrounded by lava. It feels like something they meant to expand upon more, but thankfully they didn't. Super Mario jumping didn't need to be added to the Wizardry series. It's just something that feels oddly undeveloped, like they wanted to increase the amount of running and jumping puzzles here and there in the game, but it was just never fully finished. Maybe because Heuristic Park just wasn't big enough of a team to get all of the things they wanted to do. The, the entire game definitely has a feeling of they were biting off a little bit more than they could chew. David W. Bradley was heavily responsible for Wizardry's 6 and 7, and, and he seemed to be the primary designer of those games. And in a more primitive style, he probably didn't need anyone else, and maybe he didn't realize in a more modern 3D game, he needed a lot more help from a lot more people to get everything done. He even worked as a programmer on this game, not just as a designer, so his workload was probably huge, and it kind of 
shows. Wizards and Warriors also retains the characteristic bits of dialogue that introduce new locations, like in Wizardry 6 and 7, this time with the magnificent voice work of Dave Maxwell. It adds a piquant charm to the game that reminds me of the flavor text used to introduce players to a new area in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Entering the burial pyramid of the evil pharaoh, you know that it will be filled with many pitfalls and death traps. You know, too, that you must soon discover the Dark Lord's inner sanctum before endless hordes of his demonic minions overcome you. Maxwell is even credited as the Dungeon Master in the credits. Wizards and Warriors seems to have been designed to provide a tough, rewarding challenge, encourage exploration, and provide a worthy puzzle to explore again and again. Even though I just recently beat the game, I can't remember half of the things I did in it, and plunging into each new dungeon, I'm going to have to learn it over again. And, you know, that just adds an incredible replayability to the story that something like Skyrim just doesn't have. You can just charge from one end to the other and never have to worry about any of that. I really can't oversell the design and layout of these levels. They're complex, they're difficult, they're interesting, they're fun to explore, they have all sorts of secrets in them. The underwater areas that you can go and subterranean rivers are incredible. I just loved every bit of it. Which is why seeing how great the level design is makes the next section about the combat all the more bitter for me. D.W. Bradley ranks among the greatest game designers in history, with Wizardry 7 being his grand masterpiece. Heuristic Park must have put an enormous amount of effort into designing the levels with their twists and turns and verticality and confusing layout and puzzles, and they just weren't able to give the combat the level of attention that it really needed. The most disappointing aspect of Wizards and Warriors is the combat. Unlike more story-based RPGs where NPCs and plot and dialogue are in the foreground, first-person blobbers like Might and Magic or Wizardry are built on their combat systems. Fighting hordes of opponents is the real meat and potatoes of the game, so if that doesn't work perfectly, this game is in serious trouble. There are other games like Arcanum that have terrible fighting systems that I hate, but everything else in the game, the, the, the story aspect, is so amazing that I can still love it. But this game doesn't have that kind of rich story. The combat needs to be on point, and tragically, it really is not. Wizards and Warriors is played from a first-person perspective, just like Might and Magic in the, the Wizardry games. The characters in the middle line, like the fourth or fifth position, are considered sort of protected, like in the middle, but they can still use melee attacks, so it's a little weird. It feels like something they didn't fully work out. The people in the first three and the sixth column are considered sort of in the front and everyone is in the middle. It really stands poorly next to the incredible style of Wizardry 8, where they added this tactical style of positioning people into the combat. Back in the old days of the 1980s, combat was almost always turn-based. Your party was frozen in place when you entered combat and were stuck there until you prevailed over your foes, were wiped out, or ran away. As great as the combat was, it could become tedious after a while. You just wanted to explore or maybe were having difficulty in solving a challenging puzzle and didn't want to be interrupted every five seconds for a five to ten minute combat sequence. So in the 90s, RPG makers tried to reduce the grinding by switching up the combat. For example, Might and Magic decided to allow the combat to be fought in real time if you wanted to speed up or run away from the action, but allowed the player to switch to turn-based at any time the speed became too threatening. The combat in Wizards and Warriors is done in a fairly unique adaptive time phasing system. It's a peculiar system that theoretically allows you to switch between a real-time and a more turn-based combat based on how fast you want to play. Unfortunately, it doesn't really seem to work perfectly. Even in purely real-time battle, you and the monsters slow down a little bit. It's, it's not as kinetic as a real-time first-person shooter type fight would be, like some of the later Might and Magic games could feel. Its major feature is allowing you to turn and run wherever you feel like it, thus skipping combat altogether if it goes badly. If you want to stop and think of a strategy or open your spellbook and try to pick a spell without being interrupted, you can change to a slower, more turn-based system on the fly. Then when you're ready, the combat can be ramped back up again. To start with a minor positive note, it does make combat sort of simple to avoid. If you don't want to fight, you don't have to, unlike in the wearying pace of random encounters in Wizardry 7 or 8. Aside from that, the fighting is wretched. You can move about freely on the battlefield, but that means you can easily miss your opponent. 
because it's difficult to tell how far away you are in first person. And sometimes you're fighting in a weird location where the enemy is above or below you and you really can't get to them. There are even some flying enemies like homunculi that can sort of hover above you and you're not quite certain where you are so you can waste an attack not knowing if you're close enough. All of this, clunky as it may have been, could have worked out if it wasn't for one huge problem. In almost all fights against opponents with purely melee attacks, that is, enemies that don't use magic or breath weapons, the odds are massively in your favor. For some reason or another, hitting enemies is child's play and they can barely get a decent hit on you. I strongly recommend turning the difficulty setting up, even if it's your first time. Trust me, I wasn't massively min-maxing my characters either. They were just in very little danger the great majority of the game, and battle became trivial or boring pretty quickly. Even very early on, when I should have been pathetically weak, almost no enemy was balanced properly to take me down. I never really worried about being hit, and only a tiny number of occasions did I take significant damage out of thousands of enemies I fought. I couldn't really figure it out. Were they unable to reach me? Was I spamming the attack button too fast for the enemies to react, because I was playing in real-time mode most of the time? Was there damage far too low for my armor? Why was it so low? I, I really didn't have an answer. It's just that the fights don't feel right. They, they, they don't feel like any sort of threat. All I know is that being punched, stabbed, crushed, slashed, and bit by enemies almost never did any real damage. It was like they were unable to hurt me. Combat in Wizardry 8 is its best feature. Every round is a hydra's head of branching choices you can pick from to maximize combat and death, as it should be in Wizardry. The pathetic weakness and powerlessness of most enemies made combat a nuisance at best. Something I literally stopped paying attention to. I instantly knew I was going to win and didn't really need to use anything but physical strikes. Magic was unnecessary. There's a semi-official sort of rule in video gaming that says that players are always going to choose the simplest and most direct path to victory when playing. And it's sort of a game design rule that suggests that you can put all sorts of fancy ways to accomplish something in a game, but the vast majority of players the vast majority of the time, are going to choose the easiest way to win. And that's what I did here. Maybe I could have used more spells, I could have played an entire party of spellcasters, but it just wasn't necessary. All I had to do was spam the attack button over and over and over again, and it got to a point where I wasn't even pretending on my magic using characters like the priest or the mage to even use spells 99% of the time. I just hit the attack button and they swung with their staff. It was incredibly boring and kind of ridiculous that I was able to do this, and beat virtually all enemies in that way. When I got close to enemies, I just used the attack button again and again, just spammed it. it. It almost felt a little bit like an action game or a first person shooter in a sense, because I was just pressing the attack button over and over again and whittling them down. I, I just, I didn't have to think, I didn't have to worry about it. That, that thinking about how you're going to tactically approach a situation is important in the turn-based combat of these games, and it just doesn't have it here. It seems like the real-time system, and, and I'm saying that even if you play with the, the active battle mode thing turned way towards turn-based, you still really don't have to think very much. And I think at one point they must have just realized that it wasn't working, and just realized they couldn't quite fix it. It didn't feel normal. It's not an action game, but it's also not an RPG game. It's neither. It's, it's some weird place in the middle where neither of those things work. Combat was just very unthreatening. Except when the enemy used magic against me. Then the game radically shifted from a difficulty of zero all the way up to 100. For some reason, magic is not only dangerous, it's utterly brutal and you have no ability to fight back. A party of magic users like flying imps or these strange toadstool creatures with a breath attack are a nightmare to deal with. Their spells and abilities damage all party members simultaneously and continuously round after round. Sometimes you'll get lucky and it will only be a status effect like silence or insanity, irritating enough, but you'll live, but typically it will hurt you, and I mean hurt you. There's no way to survive any of this. If you can get hit, you'll have to take at least one death, at least, and your entire party might be wiped. Usually the weakest spellcaster will go down in a heartbeat. The most difficult enemies in the entire game are, I'm not kidding, giant Venus flytraps. They are huge and can wipe out an entire party in seconds. They have a huge amount of HP, too. The only way to deal with them I know of is when they're approaching. Not an easy task because they can spawn around corners in the underground tunnels. And you have to hit them with powerful spells that have a ranged ability, like Magma Bomb and Meteor from far away. How is it this hard to kill? It's made of chlorophyll and cellulose. No! I don't know anyone who 
it deserves to get chopped up and fed to a hungry plant! They also add sonic insult onto injury with this section, because not only is it devastating to your character's health, they also play this horrendous noise during this sequence, and take a listen to this. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't even know exactly how to describe this. Uh, it's sort of like a, the tinkling of a wind chime or broken glass mixed with a kind of a high-pitched screech. It, it's like all of the most ear-splitting sounds meshed together into one noise. I and mean, They had to know that this was like uncomfortable and irritating to listen to. And I wasn't even using headphones at the time, and it's it's still horrid. Like, why is it there? I don't even want, I, I mean, I don't want to turn off the sound effects entirely, but I know when I hear it that it's just hideous. Maybe the game is just trying to tell you, whoops, you done screwed up, and you're gonna die. Speaking of the sound, there wasn't really a good place to talk about the soundtrack up till this point, and it's not great. Uh, the soundtrack is incredibly basic. The main theme is this soft, repetitive tune, and, and I really mean repetitive, I mean, it, it doesn't sound like it changes during the entire length of it. it It's almost like the first 20 seconds of a song that never get going. I, I turned it off pretty quickly because I found it really grating. Not that the soundtrack is that big of an issue, because Wizardry 8's soundtrack wasn't very good, and Wizardry 7 virtually didn't have one. But this was at a time just a couple of years after the release of Might and Magic 6 and 7, which had some of the greatest RPG soundtracks of the era. So, yeah, there's not really an excuse for that. I just turn it off and listen to the ambient noise around me, where it's going through the forest, or... It works a lot better. Uh, there's also another really irritating sound effect thing that goes on sometimes when you're out on the open sea in a boat or a raft, and you can hear the creaking of the wood all the time as you're moving. It's, it's kind of unpleasant. It Just in general, the sounds of this game are poorly implemented. I'm not talking about the, the dialogue, the people talking. That's that's a little bit different. It's very basic NPC dialogue for the most part, except for the narrator. I'm talking about just overall the, the musical qualities of this game are very, very low. So up until this point, I was willing to believe the game was a forgotten gem, but tragically, the lack of a decent combat system is fatal to wizards and warriors. Battles are a huge part of the experience, and the ball was unquestionably dropped on this aspect. It also seems impossible to suggest that the turn-based aspect of the game could be reintegrated in some way, because, like I said, these Venus flytrap creatures or anyone with a breath attack weapon really can't be fought anywhere near them. You have to utilize the real-time aspect of the game to stand far far, far away from them and hit them at range. If you don't do that, you're pretty much asking your party to die. It has to be done real time. I respect Bradley's attempt to forge a semi-new kind of combat innovation for RPGs, but it's not pulled off. The game has no middle ground. Almost all monsters present a laughable lack of threat, until the ones that are absolutely impossible to defeat. There's no difficulty curve, it's just a sheer cliff face with no way to climb. Oh and yes, in case anyone thought of this, they do occasionally group the two kinds of monsters together. Useless meat shield monsters that can't hurt you standing in front of vicious spellcasters behind them, making it very, very challenging to fight them at all. I, don't, I didn't even want to fight the battles, they were so hard. Fighting in some of the later areas is going to be really, really challenging for most players, because mana regenerates over time in this game, not by resting. So unless you have mana potions, you can just be sitting there for long, long periods of time, basically unable to fight, because you need to have these magical abilities to fight against these enemies. You, you can't do anything else. I actually kind of like the idea that it regenerates over time, because I don't have to pay attention to it, but it also is an oversimplification of the game. You know, you really need that risk of resting to make you feel like you're on an adventure and can be attacked in the middle of the night when you're weak and vulnerable. And as dangerous as it is, as a time factor while playing, it's only going to be a few seconds while you're resting, waiting for your spell points to regenerate. Here it happens in real time, so you could be wandering around for minute after minute after minute just doing nothing, running around in other 
areas where you've already beaten them, just waiting for your magic to recover in order to go into a new area. Magic is divided up into a number of separate categories and spell schools that you get access to based on what class you currently are. For instance, the Mage class starts out with access to two spell schools, the Sun School and the Stone School, and then later on they can upgrade to the Warlock where they get access to the Moon School and the Fiendcraft School. It was especially fun playing with the Fiendcraft School because it's sort of like evil demonic magic and one of the spells you can get actually allows you to possess enemies and they suddenly start fighting for you against the other monsters and that was a lot of fun to play around with. I don't want to say you absolutely need these spells, but they make the game so much more tolerable and fun. One spell is Lava Walk, which gives you the ability, of course, to walk over lava, which is situational, but in those situations, really, really useful. Another one is Breath of Air, which allows you to breathe underwater, which is super, super necessary during the underwater city section. And another one is the Moon School of Magic. Now, I didn't even realize this until tens of hours into the game, but the Moon School actually has a teleport ability. Without that teleport ability to be able to set portals near towns, you are going to have a really annoying time racing back and forth between towns and dungeons. And I hadn't leveled the Moon School up enough to really make that much of a difference, and I would have had to level grind over and over again to get it, and so I didn't really bother with it, but it's still highly recommended. You, you kinda, kinda sorta need to do that if you want to cut down on the tedium of the game. Although, I didn't really strictly need to level up because in the guilds, you can actually train in various skills. So you can spend some of your money in order to level up your magical ability, so I could have done that. I would have had to spend a huge amount of money and maybe I wouldn't have had enough, but that would have really, really helped. The priest class has access to healing and support magic, although there's a couple of damage spells in there, so usually before going into a big battle, I like to cast Heroic Might or Bless or the Haste spell on every character, and he also has various heal spells including Healing Realm, which slightly heals the entire party, and Resurrection, which occasionally you'll have to use because your characters, especially those weak characters like the mages, are gonna die quite a bit. It was very useful at one point in the game to have characters gain secondary magical abilities, like, like the Paladin and the Samurai can gain Divine and Arcane spellcasting, respectively. They did a pretty good job handling the magic in the game, it's just that Overall, the magic was, well, kinda useless compared to physical attacks. Something crucial about magic that you really need to worry about is you can actually hurt your own party with your spells. So you can cast things like Magma Bomb or Meteor, and that can reflect back on your party, which means that in order to cast them, you have to be far away from the thing you're trying to hit, so you can't really get into any kind of turn-based combat. You need to be far away from these guys and hit them before they get close to you. Those spells are really, really powerful, though. It was just very situational for me to use them, and be wary as you're clicking back and forth between each character, because you will, probably, as I did, accidentally cast one of those magma bomb spells or meteor spells really close to your characters and destroy them all accidentally with this huge bomb going off in their face. Also, there are some spells like Flame Drop that you can kind of game the game with and cast into water for some reason where enemies can't actually reach you, where these fish are hanging around, and kill them before you enter the water. I kind of like that little tactical element there. Turning to the monster design, it's excellent. I think there's a lot of variety. Their monsters are well drawn. They look good for a three 3D world. I mean, this is the early age of polygon graphics, and I, I think they look excellent for the, for the year 2000. There's also a wide variety of creature types, and they're actually better than Wizardry 8, which, frankly, looking back, had a fairly dull set of enemies most of the time, and graphically, I don't think quite approached wizards and warriors in their style. You'll fight skeletons, dragons, demons, ghosts, hellhounds, ogres, two-headed giants, were-rat ninjas, zombie samurai, the hydra, mummy, even pirates, giant crabs, and great white sharks when you reach the Lost Sea. They look great, and really made me feel excited from a monstrous manual kind of perspective of, 
if only fighting them was equally as polished. Monsters can inflict you with the customary wizardry-style status effects like silence, nausea, stone, and insanity. Insanity is an especially tough one to deal with because it can only be cured with a single spell, I think, called Restore Health, a very high-level cure spell that only a very powerful character can get. Insanity also doesn't seem to ever go away, at, at least not as far as I could tell. If you went crazy, you stayed crazy until you got back to town and were healed. Becoming poisoned was also a big problem in the Serpent Temple. I hadn't spent any time leveling up in the School of Magic to get the Cure Poison spell, and I had to just deal with it for a long time. Another intriguing concept, one that actually worked this time, is the Encounter Rate option. The game features the standard difficulty setting present in most RPGs, but also lets you pick how many monsters you'd prefer to spawn per area. You may want more creatures if you're trying to level up or farm items, or you may want to sharply reduce that in case you're having difficulty solving a puzzle and need some time to think and experiment. Sadly though, when the monsters spawn in, they're there for good. As far as I could tell, they won't despawn, at least not for a long while. That means if you leave a group of monsters to go exploring, they'll slowly chase after you, inexorably gathering with every monster you skip along the way until they're in a giant, unfightable mass of monsters. This even happens when you go to town. As soon as you turn around and leave the safety of the village, the giant man-eating Venus flytraps you left behind are there waiting for you, probably in a group and ready to attack you all at once. You probably should have had some kind of despawning of monsters after you ran away from them if you entered another screen. I know this can seem like a way to cheat, but you're already running away from the monsters to avoid combat, so you might as well be able to truly avoid it. The monsters are just like your responsibilities. No matter how hard you try to avoid them, they'll be waiting there to pile up and destroy you one day. I really like this feature, this choosing the spawn rate of the monsters. It's a little bit more complex than the standard easy, normal, hard difficulty setting, but it wasn't implemented perfectly. Speaking of the spawn rate, there was a moment in the final third of the game that almost made me quit playing Wizards and Warriors altogether. In order to access the final level, you need three magical tablets to open the ancient tomb of the evil pharaoh set Udwa khan So where are the tablets? At the bottom of the ocean in a sunken city. So you need scuba gear to explore under the water without drowning. So how do you get the scuba gear? Do you buy it? Do you find it in a tomb during a quest? No, you have to farm it. This was the early 2000s. Farming or grinding, which means you have to find and kill dozens of enemies in the hopes for a rare drop of an item you need, is always terrible. No matter how great the game is, this mechanic is always awful. Typically, farming is relegated to an optional item you may want, but the scuba gear is vital. The item is called the giant conch shell, and you need it in order to beat the underwater level. So I looked up where I have to farm this item from and found that it was dropped by creatures called Crabs of the Sea, and I was shocked. I played in this area for at least six to eight hours and had run into half a dozen forms of oceanic monster to fight and had never encountered crabs. Not once. So I turned up the enemy spawn rate to the max and wandered around for a couple of hours. Yes, I had to waste hours of playtime futzing around with this nonsense, and I really almost quit the game at this point. It just wasn't worth it, I thought. For every three conch shells you find, you can exchange them for two scuba helmets, meaning you need to farm out nine shells in order to equip a full party of six characters. And it's not just a matter of killing nine crabs, which in itself would take quite a bit of time to find. Each crab has only a chance of dropping a shell, which means you could get nothing for all your effort. It's possible to use the pickpocket ability to try and steal the shell. It doesn't make any sense, I know. Crabs don't have pockets. But that isn't guaranteed either. You can try to steal over and over and get basically nothing even from a big crowd of crabs. So after that torture, you can finally get the scuba gear. But wait, the scuba helmet increases the time it takes to drown, but it doesn't get rid of it. It just takes longer, and if you really want to last a long time underwater, you have to get the underwater breather to go along with the scuba helmet, and that you only get one per three conch shells, meaning you would have to get 18 shells if you want your guys really kitted out. 
Holy heck, it seems that I never encounter the crabs because they live in the bottom of the ocean. Like, why would I walk to the bottom of the ocean? I bought a boat to go over the ocean. I never thought to go to the bottom and wander around there. So in order to not drown in Atlantis to get the scuba gear, you have to fight creatures at the bottom of the ocean, underwater, where you could easily drown. So not only do you have to farm them, but the battles against these crabs are themselves miserable because you're under the threat of drowning. It's just torture on top of torture with this game. It's so desperately dull and tedious and stuffy and boring and desperately dull. And I absolutely, vitally, necessarily, beyond a shadow of a doubt, had to have a spell called Breath of Air that my priest could cast that prevented us from drowning. So in the end, I decided to only bother with some of the scuba helmets and basically just let one of my characters die. I let her drown because I just couldn't keep doing this forever. This whole sequence is unbelievable. Wizardry 8 also had an underwater level with scuba gear, which makes me think, was that sort of designed to be in Wizardry 8 years ago by Bradley? And then they just continued using that idea? It's a little unclear. But that game did it much, much better. If you plan on playing Wizards and Warriors, I would highly recommend cheating these items into the game. The only item editors I found seem based on modifying existing items or stats, not generating them in your character's inventory. So that basically means you're stuck using a hex editor. I'm not too good with them and I wanted to beat this game legitimately, but it seems like your best bet. Oh, I almost forgot to mention, I actually had two conch shells from a previous section of the game and threw them away. I didn't know how vital they were, so I just got rid of them to save space. Yeah, not a bright move. The crazy thing about this is that the underwater level is one of my favorite parts of the game. I loved the Atlantis myth as a child and wandering around the watery depths of a lost city dodging mutated sharks would have been pure joy. I just wish I didn't have to go through hours of drudgery to get there. I come to video games to have an adventure, not uselessly gather items. The game burnt out any remaining goodwill I had when just a few hours after the crab thing, I found to myself in another miserable situation. The final level of Wizards and Warriors is the ancient pyramid tomb of the wizard set. It looks pretty darn cool, especially because it's in a huge desert guarded by a hydra, inhabited by cyclops and two-headed monsters and giant scorpions. The pyramid itself is filled with giant balrog-like demons. As per usual with Wizards and Warriors, the melee-oriented balrogs are not a challenge, but the tiny flying homunculi creatures next to them are vicious because they cast spells that have a chance of causing all status-affecting spells simultaneously, it seems. Nice. In order to get set, you need two keys. You get the keys by killing his two demonic servants, Alamin and Satheus. Problem is, I didn't know you needed to find these keys, and didn't immediately do an in-depth search of the ground after killing Alamin. Can you blame me for not finding a key the size of a pixel I had no idea existed in this darkened pit of a room? When you kill an enemy, the body lingers as sort of a death throw on the screen over the place where he died, obscuring any treasure he dropped. So I eventually found out what happened many hours later, when I realized I couldn't find my way into the final area with just one key. Remember earlier when I said the key I required was sitting next to the body of the guy I killed in the Serpent Temple? Yeah, well for some reason, that didn't happen this time. <laughs> Tough luck. The minuscule key dropped into the shadows of this tiny room is gone forever. Yep, game officially unwinnable at this point. So I reloaded a save and raced through the level as fast as I could. That save was all the way at the beginning of the level, and I was lucky. Keep in mind that if I didn't have a backup save at all, I would have been screwed. The game would have been done, gone, lost, finished, finito. So you get nothing! You lose! Good day, sir! Imagine buying this game at full price back in the day 20 years ago, then spending upwards of 50 hours to get to this point, and then BAM, you're slapped upside the head with an unwinnable state. Everything you've done would have been forfeit, and the worst thing about it is it's so unnecessary. Why even have an item at all, much less one that you can lose or never pick up in the first place? Even Wizardry 6, 10 years prior to this, had a system where you couldn't drop items you needed to beat the game. It's just also pointless. You should have been forced to fight both demons and the door magically opens. There you go. Solved it. Kill the demon, door magically opens. 
As much crap as I give more modern RPGs, sometimes I know that something like this would never be allowed in a modern game. You're never going to lose a key in Skyrim or something like that. At least I don't think that could happen. Everything about this is just so pointless. Why would you do this? Why at the very end of the game? It's nuts. Going through all of this horrible agitation right at the end of the game, right before making this review, kind of colored my opinion of it, I have to say. I didn't go through a lot of this agitation in the other sections of the game, admittedly, but the fact that this is here at the very end of the game, after 40 or 50 hours of gameplay, is really, really grating on me. So in the end, what can you say about Wizards and Warriors? This is by no means a bad game. In fact, in many areas, it's a very good game. There are so many interesting features to it, with the level design, the monster design, how character progression is handled, it, it, it all works beautifully. However, combat is a gigantic part of this game, and it was just done horribly. It just doesn't work. It, it occupies this uncomfortable middle ground between action and turn-based, and it does neither properly. Now, I went into this game with sky-high expectations because of how much I love Wizardry 6 and 7. I mean, 7, I said, was the greatest DOS RPG ever made, and when it didn't live up to that, I was really disappointed, but I stuck through all the way to the end of the game, and I just have to say that unless you're a fanatic about these kinds of RPGs like I am, you're probably not going to like Wizards and Warriors. The combat is just ultimately pretty insipid and not really worth your time. It becomes unengaging and boring, and that's when the game isn't being frustrating with the combat, where it is ridiculous. Ridiculous. Towards the end of the game, I just really began to skip a lot of the combat. In fact, when I redid the final dungeon, Lord Set's Tomb, I actually just skipped 99% of the combat and ran past it if I could, just because I wanted to get it over with, and I realized that I could kind of just run past all of the combat if I wanted to. The game is currently available on goodoldgames.com for $6, and that's a pretty good price for a game where there's 40 or 50 hours of content per playthrough. If you love this iteration, of the RPG genre, you will likely enjoy your time with Wizards and Warriors. I didn't hate it, I just got very, very frustrated by some irritating moments here and there. Overall, I would say that I definitely had a good time. It just really began to hurt towards the end of the game with the grinding and the weird item disappearing thing with the key. I can see why D.W. Bradley really didn't succeed with this game. The game was actually really hard to get running on a regular CD, so the GOG release is really, really useful. I, I didn't have too many problems with it, although very occasionally I would quit out of the game, and for some reason it would remain still running in the background, and I would have to go under the Processes tab in the Task Manager and manually end the process for it to turn off, but other than that I was able to get it running fine with GOG, it, and, uh, you know, I, I can see why this remained a sort of forgotten game. It, it doesn't really have the old-school greatness of a Wizardry 7 or 8, and there are too many weird little irritating problems stuck here and there without the game. And the combat, the insipid, terrible combat, destroyed the game, so it's painful to see how much skill and intelligence and, and ability the people that made this game must have had, but it was just so fatally broken when they didn't understand how bad the combat was and how boring and dismal that made the game. And I'll just end the game here by mentioning the last section. At the very end of the game, you go for the final battle with Lord set ud -Wakan, the evil pharaoh, in his tomb. And he looks really cool. He's this giant floating head. And that's pretty scary, and his voice is really good. And the final battle, well, it's very odd, because you can only technically harm him with two weapons in the game. You see, if you paid attention to the plot and the story, you'll hear that the only way to harm Lord Set is by using something called the Black Fire. So you need to put the magic sword, the Maven, inside of the Black Fire in order to strengthen it enough to harm the Dark Lord. You can also do that to the staff of the Lich Guy that you save near the Black Fire. And then you can hit him with those two weapons, but that's a really weird way to have an apocalyptic, climactic final battle right before 
before the end of the game, where only two out of your six characters are allowed to hit him, and all the other four have to just sit there twiddling their thumbs, or, you know, maybe casting buffing spells or healing spells, but that's a really, really peculiar way to do this. I mean, why in the world would you create the game in this way? Yeah, why? I mean, I like the idea that you have to pay attention to the plot and remember to use the items in the Black Fire, but you should just be able to do that with all of your weapons in order to hurt him. It just doesn't make all that much sense to have, you know, four characters in your team just sitting out the final battle. But anyway, you can defeat him pretty easily. He's very, very simplistic, and as I said, my party's not min-maxed at all. It's a fairly average party, and I was able to defeat him on normal mode pretty easily. And that's with only two characters, so that, that creates this dissonance between what the game is telling you, that this is a really tough, powerful, difficult character to fight, and yet you can just defeat him with only two players. That's so odd that you can do that. It just, it just doesn't feel right. So anyway, you defeat the evil pharaoh, and you can go and talk to the ancient hero Anaphis and the angel Kira, and they'll explain to you that you've done a great job by defeating the evil Dark Lord, and they actually give you this very tepid and kind of, well, insipid ending here, where you can choose a sort of good, neutral, or evil ending. The evil ending is that you actually side with Lord Set and kill the angel Kira. The neutral ending, you kill Lord Set but keep the fantastically powerful Celestial Maven Sword. Or the good ending where you surrender the Maven Sword to Anaphis. There's really not a whole lot of point to any of this. It doesn't feel like you're doing anything good, neutral, or evil, and it's kind of odd for them to toss this in at the very last second. And I mean, the game is over, you know? In order to mean something, they would have had to, well, you know, do this, like, somewhere earlier in the game. You know, like, have you do this hours and hours ago and face maybe the final couple of dungeons without the magnificent power sword? It just feels kind of tacked on. And after you do this, you can actually continue playing the game, weirdly enough, and can, you know, keep wandering around the world of Gale Saran, which also feels kind of pointless because there's not really anything of any interest that I found to continue doing. So yeah, that was Wizards and Warriors. It was a decent game that had a lot of good ideas, and I wish I could say more positive things about it. So yeah, it's a it's a mixture of good and bad in this game. You might enjoy it, you might not. It's not exactly all that expensive, and uh, yeah, I really wish that this game could have done more. So anyway, I'm going to conclude here with the final cinematic of the game, just to let you see what that looks like, and I'm also going to link a couple of other videos that I've done, the reviews of both Wizardry 7 and 8, so please check those out if you want to see reviews of much better games than this one. And please tell me in the comments below if you've ever played Wizards and Warriors and what you thought of it, if you thought I was totally off base and that it was a hidden gem. Why did you think that way? What you thought about my criticisms of it? If you thought that it was a horrible game and there was nothing good about it, I really want to know that because I'm interested in what other people think of this sort of forgotten D.W. Bradley game. And yeah, subscribe to my channel if you want to see more reviews of movies, TV shows, and video games that I really love. And uh, yeah, my name is Michael. Thank you for watching this excessively long video. Check out my other vids and uh, have a good night. Darkness. His spirit consumed by the maven's blade, adrip with the unholy black fire. But the mortal form of Pharaoh Setu Dwakan still lay crumbling upon an altar of bone, lost deep within the pyramid tomb, still entranced in the sleep of the dead. Indeed, it took three days for the champion of the maven to discover the Dark Lord's hidden corpse. Enshrouded within a blood-stained cloth, it had grown quite foul, and in its hand was tightly clutched a glimmering scroll. The champion opened the strange parchment and began to read. So shall it be the prophecy of the age, decreed by divine will, that upon this sacred truth shall light from heaven bring. For the champion's sword will slay the shadowed darkness, and the great defender shall arise again on angel's wing. And as the last of the prophecy was read, the withered flesh of the Pharaoh's mortal form burst into flames, and soon his ash was scattering into the wind. Resting within the Dark Lord's hand had been the truth all along. Perhaps he believed the decree of the prophecy would be thwarted, that by mantle of his dark oath he could rule forever over the sons of this earth. But the angel Kara had prepared the way and guarded the sacred truth that the noble Anaphas would be reborn from his great sacrifice, and together they would herald a new champion of the maven. And so it came to pass, the prophecy made true, and peace was restored to all the land. 
And on certain nights, if you look just right, you can see Anaphis and Kara upon their thrones in the stars, watching down over the gale Saron, the sign that heaven has fulfilled its divine promise. And of the maven, it too rests within the stars, there to remain, awaiting the next champion, when once again it is time to forge new destiny. Oh, Father, do read us another story. Now, now, that's enough adventure for one night. It's time to bed with the both of you. And as you sleep in Kara's arms, aloft in heaven's glory, remember well, my little ones, the living tale is never done, and your dreams will always bring the morrow's story. Hail the dead.